stand with us. We uh, particularly want to welcome, you know, those of you who are online, those of you who are in, here in person. It's um, it's a beautiful thing to remember that we get to live these days. So let's not let them pass by without recognizing that they're beautiful. So if you guys would participate and sing along with us as we, uh, as we enjoy this time here. song of the redeemed rising from the African plain and it's the song of the forgiven drowning out the Amazon rain the song of every believer filled with God's holy fire Every tongue, every tribe, every nation, a love song born of a grateful choir. So God's people sing in glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. So God's children sing in glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. Let it rise about the four winds Caught up in the heavenly sound Let praises echo from the towers of cathedrals To the faithful gathered underground Of all the songs sung from the dawn of creation Some were meant to persist the bells rung from a thousand steeples, none rings truer than this. Powers of darkness trembled at what they've just heard. All the powers of darkness tremble at what they've just heard. Cause all the powers of darkness can drown out a single word. When all God's people sing glory. Sing glory, glory. 
seated. Sorry about that. Let's center our hearts and our minds as we go to God in prayer. Jesus, enthroned in glory of all creation, you are a shepherd to the lost and to the least. Teach us to see your face among the poor, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, welcoming the stranger, clothing the naked, and visiting those who are sick or in prison. Help us to listen to your voice so we can claim your realm of justice, peace, and endless love through Jesus, who reigns forever and ever. Pour out your power to the powerless and your salvation to the lost. Remember us in your new creation so that we may live in your peace with your holy presence to whom all honor and glory is yours. And God, we pray for the brokenness that we see in the world today, for those who are sick and dealing with COVID. May their healing go quickly. Those who have passed away to this disease, bring comfort and peace to their families, to the physicians and doctors and all the frontline folks and the companies trying to develop the vaccines. May they do it rapidly and get it out so we can get healing in this land. We pray for the tragedy this week in our area at the Children's Clinic. May you bring peace and comfort to all those involved. And God, help us to be a people who show your hope and peace and love to the world wherever we go. May we be shining examples of your light to the world around us. And let us pray together the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth that is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's good to see everybody this morning. Woo. What great worship we've had already, and I hope those of you who are watching online have experienced the joy that's in the house today. It really is great to, to be with you guys today. You know, we have such a beautiful heart in our church, and especially when it comes to serving others and taking care of our community, and that's just who we are and what we do here, and uh, as you notice, when those of you who were in the house, if you came in, you noticed a red barrel that uh, was collecting some uh, canned goods for our Round Rock Area Serving Center. That's being sponsored by our mom's group there awesome group and so whether you're on campus um, the next few weeks um, please drop those off anytime on Sunday or anytime during the week we would love to receive those donations and it's just one of the ways we take care of our community another beautiful way we're taking care of our community is this coming Sunday I'm sorry this coming Saturday Super Bowl Saturday we're calling it 
In the morning, our church is going to be gathering in our parking lot to build beds for children who are in need. This is one of the most important projects that we do all year long. In fact, some of the beds we're building for children who sleep on the floor. Some of these children have uh, slept on the floor for a year. Some families are coming out of shelters and they have no furniture. Um, this is our way of expressing the love of Jesus Christ and spreading hope in their world. And so we're gathering to build beds this coming Saturday, and uh, then we're delivering those beds um, in the afternoon, and you are so welcome to be a part of that. All you have to do is go to our church website and sign up and tell us how you can volunteer and how you'd like to be a part of that. And we, we encourage you to do that. We're going to be taking extraordinary measures uh, to ensure everyone's safety by wearing masks, social distancing, having families work together, limiting contact with our families we're delivering to. So we're trying to do everything right, but doing what's right and taking care of these precious families that need our help. Uh, you have been so gracious in your donations already in, um, di in um, providing beds for these families. It takes about $225 to build the bed and provide the bedding for each single bed and about $350 for the bunk beds. And uh, so the donations are coming in. The challenge for us has been already the requests for beds have more than doubled what we did last year. So while we delivered some 40 beds last year, well over 80 beds are asked for this year. And in your donations is what makes that possible. So Monica and I want to invite you um, to join us in sponsoring a bed for these kids and being a part of this amazing, amazing ministry uh, of our church. And you can donate just by texting on the screen beds to 44321 or going to our website. This is just one of the many things we do every week in our church. We live and we minister and serve for the sake of others in our community. Do you realize that your regular offerings every single week are teaching our children what it means to follow and love Jesus Christ in their lives? Through your offerings, we're able to take care of sick and grieving and elderly in our community. Through your offerings, every single week, we're taking care of hungry families and feeding them. Through your offerings, every week, we are proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ not only in our community, but literally around the world. Your gifts make that possible. And so I just want to say thank you for doing that. And thanks for all the ways that, that you are supporting every single week. The beautiful and wonderful and so important ministry of our church. So you can give with the, uh, through just by texting First Hope to 44321 or by giving online or through the offering baskets at the back. But know when you give you're making a difference in somebody's life uh, for the glory of God. So let's pray together and ask God to bless our gifts and our lives. Father in heaven, as we give, we know we have an opportunity to share in the work of the kingdom of God. So Father, use our labor and use our love to be an expression of your love and labor among the people that you've placed in our lives. In the name and for the glory of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. You have been arranged by the hands of His Majesty, given this earth for a time. Designed with a perfect intention, you have been crowned. Don't let the world steal your magic. You are no child of man, you're a child of God. Born with the strength to be ready for whatever may come. ourselves determined with focused intent on the Lord to work out our faith with trembling love and joy 
Let us grow strong in the ways of righteousness, encouraging those who are in need of love. Let us never be hasty to throw the first stone. The reading is from 2 Timothy. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message, be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable, convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Last time you won, but I'm going to win this time. We'll see about that. You go first. I just love playing checkers with you, Mom. It's fun, isn't it? Why'd you make that move? I was going to go there. Ugh. Uh, uh, uh. You have a jump. You have to take it. But I don't want to go there. If I go there, you'll jump me twice. I'm sorry, that's how the rules are. Take your bread. 
I don't like your rules. So do you think you're going to win? I don't know. You've got some pretty good jumps. All right, let's see. I love playing checkers with you, Mom. So special thanks to uh, the Sampsons for Aaron and uh, Harper. Aaron is our new uh, church council chairperson, and we are thankful for her service there. And then we're already seeing at the age of nine, Harper's got some leadership skills of her own. And so we are excited to be sharing in this series with you. And this is the finale sermon of Checkers Anyone, Finding Your Strategy for Winning in 2021. We believe God wants you to win in 2021. And you say, well, where'd you get that? Well, was Paul kidding in the eighth chapter of Romans when he says God has made us to be more than conquerors through him who loves us? But you might be asking, well, then, if God wants me to win, does he want somebody else to lose? Well, this is a different kind of winning, isn't it? And in addition, it's winning that has losing embedded within it. One of the things about checkers, and this is what Pat was trying to share with us a little bit last week when he told us that, you know, it is a rule in checkers. If you have a jump, you have to take it, and it, it means risking losing. You could actually say in checkers, you win through strategically losing. So Tina and I, when we were in the early uh, days of our marriage, we played checkers, and she, she shellacked me thoroughly every time. I guess maybe that's why we don't play checkers very much anymore. Uh, you know, but one of the ways she'd do that is she'd say, you have to take this jump. And I knew if I did, it was always going to work to her advantage. Well, last week, uh, we, fin we had a video also, and it was where uh, Matarino had to endure the trauma of being triple jumped by his wife, Celinda. And she really enjoyed that a little too much, if you were watching. She, she took all of his captured pieces and put them in a beautiful pyramid that just was meticulously arranged, just kind of to rub his nose in it. But there's something else happening in the game of checkers. What you want to do is gradually try to get one of your pieces from its home side to the other side of the board, and when you get it to the other side of the board, what happens? You get, you get kinged. All right, and so, and when you get kinged, now it has new capabilities. It, it, when you have just a checker, it has, always has to go forward, but when you get it kinged, it can go forwards and backwards. And if you'll notice, most people who win at checkers have several crowned pieces. But I've got a question for you. Uh, how do, are those crown pieces made? Well, there's your checker. Where does the other one come from? The one, the one that's been taken. So you, become, you get kinged by a past loss. And so this person who then wins the game with a whole set of kinged pieces, they are winning because of a whole group of past losses, strategically losing in the, on the way to winning. Is that a possible biblical thing? Well, let's go to the story of Genesis 37 with the character of Joseph. You'll remember he was the guy with the big dreams. He was going to rule the world. Most of all, he was going to rule his brothers, and they didn't like that. And so his arrogance was just ever apparent, and it had ruined their relationship with his brothers. The truth was, his dream would come true. But not in the way that he thought, for Joseph was in his own way. Have you ever been in your own way? 
So one of the things in checkers is you can't jump your own piece. So sometimes in order to get some mobility in the game, you've got to allow one of your pieces to get jumped so that you've got room to move. Joseph, in the story, ends up having to go through being thrown in a pit and then being sold as a slave and then thrown in prison under false charges. And it's while he's in prison under false charges that he interprets the dreams of his guard. And the guard tells Pharaoh, that, hey, this guy can uh, interpret dreams. He can probably help you. And so then he does help Pharaoh. Then he becomes third in command in the kingdom. And with that, he ends up fulfilling his dream as his brothers and father are all kneeling before him, but not to be ruled by him, instead to be served by him. And it was losing that made all the difference. Let's go to another story. Uh, this one's about a character in the book of Judges named, named Gideon. And Gideon was commanded to take on the Midianites, who were just wreaking havoc on the children of Israel. So. Hearing God's command, he says, I'm going to do my very best for God. I mean, you can't ask for anything more than that, doing your very best for God. And so he gets 32,000 that are in that army. And God sees that Gideon's got a motivational issue. He's doing his best for God. In other words, all it's going to be all up to him. And so he says, uh, Gideon, we need to pare down this army. So you tell everybody that's afraid of the Midianites to go home to their families. And 22,000 of the 32,000 go home to their families. Now he's down to 10,000. It's not looking good. God's not through. He's still going to try to make him doing his best for God to make this work. And so God pairs the army until there are only 300 left. It's now going to be impossible for him to win. And it's going to require that he be in a total partnership with God and God carrying the bigger load. And God wins running away with it. I should say, the Midianites ran away. So, so wins convincingly. So what was Gideon's problem? He wasn't necessarily in his own way. He was in God's way. Have you ever been in God's way? And off on the way to getting on the other side of that is by strategically losing. So, are you, strategic, are you in your way? Are you in God's way? Well, here's another example. It's, it's about Jesus himself. You know, there's a, an old gospel hymn, and I love the gospel hymns. But there's one that's called Stand By Me. Not the Stand By Me we tend to sing in this service, but, uh, but it's, it's also sometimes called When the Storms of Life Are Raging. You have to watch those pesky hymns. They can bring you a lot of hope, but they also can sneak in some stuff. This one sings, When the hosts of hell assail And my strength begins to fail Thou who never lost a battle Stand by me. Never lost a battle? When Jesus was preaching and they wanted to shove him over a cliff, you don't think he felt the pinch of that? Do you think when he talked to the rich young ruler and he wanted to be a disciple, and yet when the price was too high, the rich young ruler went the other way? Don't you think he wondered, maybe I should have rethought that or said it a different way? Don't you think he felt the pinch uh, when his own closest to him disciples uh, just left him alone? Don't you think he felt the loss? And then on the cross, there was no bigger symbol of, of loss and the crucifixion. But I'm afraid we Protestants have been trying to empty the cross of loss for a long, long time. And because Jesus was willing to strategically lose, undefeated Jesus, no. Maybe biggest loser Jesus, yes. And because he was willing to strategically lose, you're better. And the world is better. So, in preparation for this sermon, I have been uh, reading Sam Weinman's book, uh, Winning, Win at Losing. Uh, I commend it to you. 
But one of the things that he says early in the book, which I liked, he says, you know, it's not that any of us wants to lose. That's like wanting your colonoscopy. You don't want that. Uh, he, he says, not only that, he says, uh, it's kind of like Cam Newton felt after that uh, stunning upset loss uh, uh, by the Denver Broncos had done it to the Carolina Panthers. And he said in his hurt following the game, uh, show me a good loser and I'll show you a loser. You know, and, and there's some truth in that. And, and sometimes we don't get much out of our losses. Instead of being a, a strategic loser, we're just a loser. And there's been a lot of losses that we've been taking at this time, you know, especially with COVID and all that's been spinning from it. Things that are beyond our control and maybe some things that have been our own personal failures. And, and so we tend to kind of compare our scars with one another. And so uh, this is what Brene Brown says that we do in her book, Rising Strong, is we, we get together and say, oh, man, this has been really tough. And uh, yeah, God's getting me through or I'm making it through. And then the person says next to us, yeah, I know it's tough. And I'm afraid I probably have it even tougher than you've had it. And we one up each other uh, on how we've gotten through our tough times. But what she says is we often don't do the work that's necessary in our times of loss. Uh, that what we do is uh, we kind of explain it away, we gloss it over, and, and we don't face the truth that is there, and we don't uh, find the growing edges that are there. And she says we end up with gold-plated grit. Now, we need the grit, right? But we gold-plate it so it doesn't really do us or anybody else any good. Uh, James Lohr, who uh, leads the Human Performance Laboratory, and that trains Olympic athletes in Orlando. He says that a lot of times when we are facing our losses, that what we do is we develop stories we tell in the night to get us through. But we don't face the truth about what's there, and so we don't grow. We don't, grow. We don't strategically lose. We just lose. So, are you strategically losing that you might win? I'm going to have us bring a picture up on the screen. Maybe you recognize her, uh, if you would do that. Uh, this is Reshma Sajani. Uh, she is the CEO of Girls That Code. And it's part of a movement that invites girls and young women into high-tech and so it's, it's been her dream to, to be part of mobilizing women in that way. But that wasn't her first dream. Her first dream was to be in politics. She was going to, uh, so she ran for Congress in the state of New York. And everybody was saying, she's a bright and shining star. She, she captured people's attention. She spoke so well. I said, this is going to be great. Well, she got to the primary vote, and she got 19% of the vote. Crushing disappointment. So the next day, instead of saying she was a bright and rising star, they were saying she was the flop, right? So then in 2013, she decides that she's going to run for public advocate of New York City. And again, they're talking great about her. She is going to be a great force for justice in the city of New York. She ends up getting third in the vote at 15%. So we're going in the wrong direction, right? Well, in between the first loss and the second loss is when she created this startup called Girls Who Code. And that year, she had 40 girls come through it. This past year, she had 40,000 girls go through it. And it is her goal in her life to equip one million girls and young ladies for service in high tech. So I was watching a, a, a TED Talk in which she was speaking, and, and she said an issue really that was bigger than just high tech. She says, you know, in our society... Boys are socialized to be brave. 
They are on the playground bars and they jump from the top, sometimes head first. They break an arm or, or whatever. Then they get up sometimes and are back on them even with their cast. And they're taught to be brave. They experience failure and they just get back up. But she says, we socialize girls to be perfect. And because we socialize girls to be perfect, they don't get to experience the freedom that boys do to experience loss and learn the lessons that are there and, and, and to grow through those to become even stronger than they have been before. And so she says, I am committed to having a generation of girls and young women who are brave, not perfect. I wouldn't bet against Reshma Sojani because she's just one that would be willing to do a public face plant on the way to winning. So we have our scripture lesson from Timothy where Paul encourages Timothy in some really difficult times to, to stir him to faithfulness in the gospel. You know, preach the word, uh, do the work of an evangelist, uh, sacrificially offer yourself. It, it, it's, it's, it's get right to it, and it's difficult times that, are, that the gospel is having. It so reminds me of my own ordination service in 1988, June the 1st in Glorietta, New Mexico, where they called us forward and then each one of us kneels and the bishop puts his hand on our head and the district superintendents put their hands on our shoulders and, uh, and I had a mentor pastor putting his hand on my shoulder and Tina's there putting her hand on a shoulder and then he says boldly for all to hear, Willard Norman Cotton, Jr. Now you know why I go by Will. <laughs> Take thou authority to preach the word, administer the sacraments, and order the church. In other words, the rest of my life was to be dedicated to preaching the gospel and to caring for people and to lead the church. And my name was being called out and my life was being affirmed before more than a thousand people. What a heady moment. It was a holy moment, but it was also a heady moment. Also a naive moment. In the years since, there have been times when for that ordination, I paid a pretty high price. And only God knows just how many mistakes I have made before him and before everyone else. And this October, I'll, I'll be there at another ordination service, and I will see some other people have that experience, and I will renew my own acceptance of those directives again, hopefully with a little more humility, hopefully with a little more uh, resilience and a little more sense of God's grace. Yes, you see, I'm strategically losing on the way to winning. Paul's ministry is not finishing in the way that he had hoped. Paul had a grand strategy. You talk about ambitious. He, where he, and he wrote a lot of his letters from Rome. And, and he, so he went to Rome, though, to actually be with the main leaders that were there and eventually get an audience with Nero, with Caesar, because he wanted to convert Nero to the faith and so make it so that he could convert his own world to Christ. That's why he was there. But one of the things that happens when you presume and try to get on Caesar's agenda, then you can become inconvenient to Caesar and you can become inconvenient to all the powers that be.
And the truth is, he never gets an audience with Caesar. First Timothy, when that letter was written, he was under house arrest in the comfort of a home. But by the time we have Second Timothy in our scripture lesson today, he is in stocks. He is chilled in the cold. He is all by himself, and he is awaiting his own execution. Things had not worked out as he had hoped. You could hear him say to God, I'm sorry, God, this is not the way I wanted it to end. But then he shares some of his most eloquent words, words that we often share at funerals. And I wonder why only there, because they're good for a day like today, where he says, I have fought the good fight. I have run the race. I have kept the faith. And now there is laid up for me the victor's crown of righteousness. It's the picture of a laurel wreath that was put on the winner of the Olympic marathon. What he is saying is, though it looks like the worst is happening, the best is yet to come. He is going to go before Christ and say, King me. Do any of you here remember the name Dan Jansen? Dan Jansen was an Olympic speed skater. Uh, he was in the 1988, 1992, and 1994 Winter Olympics. Uh, so, uh, he was from a whole family of speed skaters, and his dad, uh, Harry, had raised his boys to do that in their community, and uh, they just lived their lives around a 400-meter circle. And uh, since he was the third one being raised, he uh, had been schooled in losing very well by his older brothers. But he became really good at speed skating. He was setting records at an early date. He didn't always win his races. There was one that he had lost that he was supposed to win when he was just 11 years old. And after losing the race and expecting his dad just to put his arm around him and say, uh, son, you'll do better next time. Instead, his dad put his arm around him and said, uh, you are more than skating around in a circle. He continues to just excel in the sport and in his setting Olympic records. Or not Olympic records, but setting records all the way. And in fact, just before uh, the, the first 1988 Olympics, he was setting records that would break Olympic records. But in that year before, uh, his sister Jane uh, developed leukemia in that year of special preparation for the Olympics. And despite all the treatments that they gave Jane, she continued to deteriorate. And by the time it came to be in the Olympics, uh, they told him he was not sure he was going to go. But his family said, and, both, and his sister said, you need to go. And so he goes to the Olympics in Sarajevo, and that's there that um, while he's there, he has one of that dreaded call where he speaks to her, and she can't speak back, and it's the day before he is to race the 500-meter sprint. And so they have their time on the phone. He really doesn't even want to be there. He wants to be with the rest of his family. And the next morning, she passes away. That afternoon, he is to skate the 500 meters. And so he decides to do it. But they could see that there was, his eyes were hollow. They could see in his stride that he wasn't fully in it. Yes, he was, he was winning the race in that early part, but as he rounded that first turn, he just misstepped. And when he did, he fell. And he crashed into the padded uh, thing around the circle. And he was out of the race. So the next day, he was to do the thousand meters. A tougher race for him, but he was going to do that in memory of his sister. And so this was going to be the story of all stories for the Olympics. 
He runs that race for his sister, and he's, and he's winning the race. But all of a sudden, inexplicably, his skates go out from under him, and again he falls, and he's out of the race again. And so what would have been a tremendous Olympic story becomes a story of the one who fell. In 1992, he goes to the Olympics in Albertville. And he's excited to go into the Olympics because this is his time to redeem all that. He's going to win gold this time. And two weeks before he does the uh, Olympics there, he shatters the world record in the 500 meters. So he's ready. So he gets into the Olympics, and he runs the first race, and he comes in sixth. And the next day, he runs the 1,000 meters, and he comes in 26th. One of the press writers says as, as he's going out one day, at least you didn't fall this time. He was so distraught, and his father came over to him. And he expected to hear, there's more to you than skating around a circle. But instead, he heard these words, you're my hero. It's important to know who declares you the winner of the race. Just like in your life, when you run this race, it's important to hear your heavenly Father say, you won. Dan Jansen said, you know, this is, uh, I knew then that it was okay, that I could go forward. So then in 1994 is when they changed the Olympics to off years. So he only got two more years. And so he was in Lillehammer for that one. And so, again, it was the same picture. World records ahead of time. And they get into it, and it's the 500 meters, and he comes in fourth. So now he has one more race in his Olympic career. And he realizes that he had the goal wrong they had all made it about the Olympic medal. It had all been about getting gold. When the truth is, he now knew that it wasn't so much about winning gold. It was about skating for the joy of skating. All that he had been through, all he had won, and all that he had lost. And so he went to his family and he said, win or lose, I am going to have fun with this last skate, and I invite you to have fun with me. And so he begins that finale race of his Olympic career, 1,000 meters, not even his favorite race, his hardest race. And he goes stride for stride, doing it for the joy of skating. And he opens this enormous lead. Everybody is catching the shards of his ice. And he ends up setting a world and an Olympic record in the 1,000 meters. He gets the gold medal with his focus on the joy of skating. And then he goes over and does a victory lap. But first, he picks up his young toddler daughter puts her on his shoulder his daughter who he has named Jane and does the victory lap you see it's who calls us the winner it's knowing why we run the race in the first place. I fought the good fight. I have run the race. I have kept the faith. It's the life of strategically losing in order to win. 
And with you and me, there is a double win in all this. In this life, we lose in order to win, and it builds into us resilience and wisdom and greater partnership so that we experience victory in this life and in what we think and we say and we do. We experience heaven in the now. Don't ever forget that. But then there is a greater win in your future. And it's that one where God declares you the winner. And you realize that it's all been worth it. And that it, it's our crowning achievement. And it's happened by grace, often in spite of ourselves. And it's in that moment, with joy, we say to our reigning Savior, ping me. And this time, it's forever. And all the people said, amen. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, our life is a mixture of some days when we win and sometimes we lose. But even when we lose, because we are in partnership with you, we can learn. We can grow. We can become more than we've ever dreamed. Lord, Help us in our hearts in this moment, regardless of whatever is happening in our lives, winning and especially in losing, to turn to you and discover the secret that is there, that in you, winning's not just now, it's forever. In the name of Christ, amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our closing song together. Lord, I come and I confess bowing So here you go into this week. I predict there will be wins and there will be losses in this coming week. But no matter which happens, you know your end game. Your end game is that you are going to be crowned. You are going to be crowned in your losses in this life and grow. 
You're going to be crowned in the future with that which is forever. Regardless, you win. And so with that confidence and with that joy and with that hope, go into your world and shine. Shine with the very glory of God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all the people said, Amen. So Father, teach my soul to rest to you. When temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Yes.